So um, I'm sure at the beginning of the course, Dieter covered the um, classic definition from Ron Azuma about um, how augmented reality you know, com is, combines real and virtual images, it's interactive and it's registered in 3D. A really key part of augmented reality is not just to show content, but allow people to interact with the content. And so that's what I talk about today, is this middle part here, is how we can um, interact with the content that we, that we see. So, of course, you could use augmented reality to see, you know, in this case, a dinosaur in the room in front of you. But the question is, uh, how do you now interact or, or with that dinosaur and make it do something in response to your actions uh, as well? So there are several types of interaction, and I'll, I'll go through um, a few of these, and then I'll also talk about some um, design um, guidelines for AR. So, um, so, so some, of the most interest, uh, some of the simplest AR interfaces are simply just browsing interfaces where you can see an object and you can um, uh, just walk around it. Then there's some people have done more 3D inter AR interfaces that support 3D user interaction, uh, looking at tangible services or tangible interfaces, and then a tangible AR, um, more natural interaction with gesture and speech and agent-based interaction. And I should mention, all these slides will be on the website as well, so feel free to take photographs if you want to, but, but from tomorrow onwards, or a couple of days onwards, you have to download everything and get the videos as well, so you don't have to record everything I'm saying if you don't want to. So, jumping off with AR information browsing, these were some of the first AR interfaces developed, and, um, and as such, some of the most simple. So you can see a picture here from over 20 years ago of a person looking at a fake breast and seeing virtual ultrasound superimposed inside the breast. So with this type of interface, it allows you to basically have um, a window into the VR or uh, virtual content. So you can manipulate that window around and you can see the content from different angles. But there's very little interaction. So uh, another classic example is uh, on, from Junoraki Moto down here. This was called the Navicam. And with this one, you could hold a, a small uh, screen in your hand, and as you moved around the world, you'd see virtual tags appearing in the real world, and the tags would respond to your, um, your looking at them. So this is the first example over 20 years ago of a tag-based um, AR system. So here's a video of the Navicam working, and this was done by uh, Jun Rekimoto at Sony. And you see him here holding his, um, his screen up. The screen was actually tethered to a desktop PC, so it wasn't fully self-contained. And then as he got close to this picture, you see a little tag appearing, in this case telling you when Rembrandt was alive. And over here, he can look over and see uh, a tags um, appearing on um, this videotape. So you could tag any real object and have it respond to you. Um, and what's happening in this case is that there's some computer vision algorithms that are recognizing that barcode of, of patterns, so the red and blue uh, bars. So when he goes over to the bookshelf and looks, it tells him what new books are in the bookshelf. So very simple um, browser-based AR where you just inf browse information in the real world. Of course, that's been continued. And so today we see many, many examples of people um, using handheld devices and pointing at pieces of paper and seeing virtual content popping out of the paper or walking around the real world and seeing GPS tags in the real world. And in most cases, the, there is quite simple interaction using the touch screen on the phone or some simple graphical user interface. And most of it's about information consumption. So to give you a couple of examples of this, on the left hand side here, this is an example from um, Blipper. And, um, oops. So in this case, you've got a source bottle and you can go into the supermarket, you can look at the source bottle and on top of the source bottle will pop out um, uh, recipes you can uh, do with that. And then on the right hand side is a, a Vuforia app where you can see um, um, a virtual uh, car appearing over a, a card. So you can see very, very simple interaction, just touching the screen on the um, source bottle app, or in this case, rotating the card around. So this is an example of information browsing on your on an AR. You can do it on a bigger scale as well. So um, this is a very nice example from, from Pepsi where they uh, used a location-based um, information browsing. In this case, what they did is they took um, the side of a bus shelter in the UK and put a big screen in it, a camera, and then look, made fantastic things appear. So here's a meteorite coming down out of the sky. Um, this is um, a person looking out there and they can see UFOs flying in, in the air. And um, this guy looks out and you can see, um, um, well, you'll see in a minute, so they created the illusion that it was a piece of glass because they had a camera on the other side so you could see right through it. But it was actually an AR experience. And um, 
again, very, in this case, there's no interaction at all, so you just watch what's happening. So here's an a octopus grabbing somebody from the sidewalk. But very entertaining, to say the least. It's very, this type of AR is very popular with advertisers. So a second example here is for the um, Axe um, uh, links. And in this case, um, what they did is they had... Um, they, um, they had um, uh, virtual angels fall to the ground. So you'll see in the train station on the right here, um, they had a very large uh, jumbotron with a camera pointing down at the ground as well. And when you stood on this tracking symbol here and looked up, you would see um, these angels uh, come to ground, come to the, gr the earth, and it was part of their um, deodorant marketing campaign. So one interesting thing to look at is that even though there's no interaction between the angels and the people, people try to interact with them. So you'll see people trying to pose with them for photographs or pretend they're um, holding them or trying to hold their hand or things like that. So um, there's a very compelling um, use case for AI in that case. But both of these are very simple browser-based systems. So that was kind of the very first type of AR where you could just see content and maybe move your camera around. Um, a few years after that, people started looking at how you could build more interactive uh, 3D experiences. And uh, of course, um, for the decade or so before that, people in virtual reality had been doing a lot of research on 3D interaction in, in VR environments. And some of the lessons they learned from that, they brought over to AR. So in this case, you can see two people sitting across the table, and they're wearing see-through headsets. And on the table is a, a factory plan. And in each of their hands, they hold a, a magnetic tracker. So they know exactly where their hands are. And they can reach out and grab objects and start moving them with their hands around them. So now you, do, you don't just have viewpoint control, but you have traditional 3D user interface interaction with your hands and, and, um, and direct manipulation of the content. So here's a video of, of that system working. This again is quite old, but you'll see here um, the person, both with see-through headsets, and they've got virtual blocks in front of their faces, and the blue blob in the middle is actually a 3D menu, so when you put your hand inside the blob, you can pull out an object, a, a, a block, and then you can build uh, blocks together. So they're working together to try and build um, some sort of building. But the key thing here is that now instead of just seeing the AR content, because they have these magnetic trackers in their hand, they can reach out and grab it and start moving the content around. So it supports full 3D interaction. So this is quite a long time ago, but there's more recent examples. One very nice one is this example of a, um, of a AR graffiti. So in this case, um, the idea is to uh, let people put virtual graffiti in the real world. And so uh, this was done about five years ago. And so you have a person going to this big empty warehouse. They set some cameras up so they can track the person's location in the real world. And then they, um, he has this um, old air toolkit marker on his head to track his head position, to track his hand. And as he moves his hand through space, he can start painting in 3D space and doing graffiti in the real world. So you'll see that um, happening in a second. So here's a headset display on so we can see what he's doing. But um, of course we can't see it until they show you the AR view which is coming up here. So you can see him painting now in the real world. So again, this is a very nice example of using 3D input from the user to now create um, an interaction as well. And there's lots of research that's been done. So now he's made a flower and he's going to walk around and see the flower from any direction. So there's a lot of very well-established techniques for 3D user interfaces, and there's a really great book that you should buy if you're interested. It's just a, a new version just came out um, called uh, 3D User Interfaces. And in this book, it talks about some of the basic tasks that you typically do in a 3D interface. So you typically want to have the ability to select objects, to ability to ma manipulate them in some way. Um, um, sometimes you want to be able to navigate uh, through um, scenes or, or find your way through scenes and also to have some form of system control so that you can upload files or change system control things. And this book talks about how you can uh, develop for that in both AR and VR and even desktop 3D environments, so I highly recommend buying that. So one example with AR for a selection, for example, if you have a, a mobile phone and um, you know, you want to, you, you, you're looking through the phone and you're seeing your AR content, there's a, a couple of different ways you can select the content. One um, way is to actually move your phone up to where the content is and put your phone inside the content and select it by touching. Or you can also do selection by ray casting. So if you tap on the screen, you cast an invisible ray out from the screen and whatever the ray collides with, it lets you pick or move or interact in some way. 
So you can use the touch screen as an input method for your um, system. So some of the advantages and disadvantages of, of having that type of interaction is that it lets people interact with 3D virtual content anywhere in space. You saw the graffiti, you can paint graffiti all around you. And it's a very natural, familiar interaction just using gestures. But one of the disadvantages is that um, you oftentimes have to have special devices to uh, support that interaction. So for example, with the, um, the blocks I showed you before, you had to have a special magnetic tracker that would track your hands. So you couldn't just use your natural um, hand gestures. So one of the third types of um, uh, interaction metaphors is augmented surfaces or tangible interfaces. And the basic idea of this is that you can project onto real objects, and then when you're projecting onto an object, like a table for example, you could use other objects on the table to, let, to help support and interact with the content. One of the oldest examples was a, a project called the Digital Desk that's uh, 25 years old now. So in this case they had a couple of projectors projecting onto the um, table, a projector and a camera. The projector would show documents and then you could use your hands to move the documents around and there's a camera recognizing your hand gesture. So this was a long time ago, but those um, same ideas have now been um, uh, flowed through since then. A very nice example of that is again the work of Jun Rekimoto. In this case he developed what he called augmented surfaces and this combined laptops and projectors. So the idea was with the laptop you have a private screen and then if you want to you can drag content from the laptop screen onto the table and the table is a more public uh, workspace and then you also put it on the wall if you want to. So if you want to do that one of the difficult questions is, is how do you um, drag the content from your screen to the table to the wall. And So I'll show you a video and you can see how we solve this problem in a very nice way. When you watch this video this is from 1998 so this is 20 years ago, and you'll see that um, some of the concepts he shows in this video still haven't been implemented today, so it's a very nice example of doing futuristic um, research. So let me just play this. So you'll see in the video, uh, first of all, um, them coming to sit at a table, and the table has, a, a, there's a table and a wall, and above um, the table there are two cameras. There's a, a, a small wide field of view camera that can capture the whole table, and there's also a pan tilt zoom camera, which is the black one, that can zoom in into different spots on the table. So they sit on the table, and then first of all, the, the computer vision system recognizes there's a laptop on the table, so it projects a blue circle where the laptop is. This is what the computer vision system is seeing. And as he moves his laptop around, the circle moves as well. So the computer knows where the laptop is. Now you can drag things from the screen onto the table. You can see here, he's using the mouse to cast a virtual beam onto the table, and when he pulls the document onto the computer, it appears on his um, screen. Now we can highlight a real object. The camera above takes a photograph, and now it projects the photograph back onto the table, and he can copy that onto a screen as well. So it's a very natural way of copying real, ob real uh, objects. And you can now have two people, um, in this case what they're trying to do is, is put together a PowerPoint presentation. So they're using their um, virtual uh, laser pointers to uh, manipulate um, slides on the table and start talking about the slides. So you can easily arrange slides on the table. And they have another um, way of manipulating by using a laser pointer. So here's a laser pointer and you can make a, a rotation gesture with that and it'll rotate the slides around. But more importantly you can use this to put objects on the um, wall. So people around the table can see what's happening but if you're in the room you can't see what's on the table really. So this, they have this metaphor called pick and beam where they point at the table turn the laser pointer off and then point at the wall and the uh, images appear on the wall again. So you can easily share now with everybody who's in the room. So this is kind of a more public display space. And then with these little barcodes you can, um, you can drag uh, images back to the book and now those images appear attached to that barcode and it becomes um, associated with that little barcode. So this is the same as what they did with the Navicam before. And then finally, you can put real objects down that have content on them as well. So this, this is a representation of a movie file, it's a movie tape, so you can drag things together. So this shows how it all comes together. This is a furniture layout application. So you can drag furniture from his laptop onto the table, and you'll see it goes from a 3D view on the laptop to a 2D view on the table. And then when the furniture's on the table, you can start arranging a small scene. But you can also drag furniture from real magazines. So you'll see that in a second. So on the pages of the magazine, they have those tags. And so I can recognize which page you're looking at, and you can then use the, the, the laser pointer to drag um, virtual copies of furniture off the real page and arrange this little scene. So it's a very nice blending of the real and virtual uh, world. And then once you've got the scene arranged, um, now you want to look at it. This is a top-down view. You want to look at it from a, a 3D view. So they put this camera in the scene. This is not a real camera. It's not plugged in. But it's just supposed to show you where you want to draw the virtual scene from. 
So when they arrange the camera, then you'll see on the, on the big screen there, the 3D scene being drawn from that point. So this is a very nice example of how you can use augmented surfaces to be able to let you have interaction together and use real and virtual objects together. Um, more recently, here's an example of a sand table. Some of you may have seen this before, where you can take a real uh, table of sand and you can start digging in it or arranging it. And if you have a depth camera above, it knows the height of the sand and it can start projecting different images onto the sand depending on what you're, um, what you're doing. So he's going to fill this. Um, I think he's going to put water there eventually. So you can uh, explore some different types of um, terrain modifications. So again, this is a very nice blend between a real physical surface and the projection system. Um, th these are th there's an extension of this uh, which is called Tangible User Interfaces. This was made popular by Professor Hiroshi Ishii from the MIT Media Lab. And his basic idea was that you could create digital shadows for physical objects. So you could use physical objects to interact with digital content in a number of different ways. So in one way is you could have um, ambient information, which is um, always available. So if you go to visitor's lab, here on the wall here's these little paper pinwheels. And normally these, these wheels um, you blow to make them turn around. In his lab, these wheels are connected up to motors and to an Ethernet monitor. And they spin depending on how much network traffic is going in, in his lab. So if you sit in the lab, out of the corner of your eye, you'll see these wheels spinning around. And you'll see how much traffic is going. So this is the idea of this is it's showing you information in the background. But there's also these uh, graspable user interfaces that use real objects that are familiar to people to let you interact with content. So in this case, they made a special paintbrush. And uh, normally with a paintbrush, you take the paintbrush and you paint, and it puts paint color on, on, on the walls or on objects. In this paintbrush, they put a camera in the paintbrush and a touch sensor. And then what the idea is that the camera can capture whatever color you put the paintbrush against. And then you can paint with that color on the wall. So it's a way that you can very easily select colors you want to do. And the, the important thing, though, is that it's because it's a paintbrush, everybody knows how a paintbrush works. So un unlike some of the 3D user interface stuff I showed you before, where you had special tools that did things for you, in this case, you've got a tool that looks familiar and you know how to use, and you can interact with that. So here, you can see the um, paintbrush uh, working. So they just touch different objects and then start painting with that color on the wall. So this is an orange, so now you can start painting with orange. And they grab this pattern here, and they can start painting with that textured pattern. And the paintbrush also has a video camera in it, so it can record video clips. So they just captured that person's eyes. So you can paint with animated um, um, uh, patterns as well. And if you record um, sequences of video, you can make some quite funny things happening when you start painting the sequence on, on the screen. You'll see that in just a minute. So they're painting with words there. The dog, the dog here. And here's the uh, video movement. So you get the eye, recorded a little video of the eye clip, and then as you paint, you can stretch the video frames um, across the canvas. So now she's painting with the eye there, and you can see the animation going here. So this is a very nice example of taking a familiar object, a paintbrush, but giving it magical powers by, get, by adding sensors and computing power. And there are many other examples as well, people using blocks that have intelligence in them and, and so forth. Um, some of the lessons from this type of tangible interface is that objects uh, make us uh, smart. So the shape of the paintbrush shows you which part you're supposed to hold and which part you're supposed to paint with. They also aid collaboration. So what you saw around the table there with um, Jun Rikimoto. When they're sitting around the table, they could easily collaborate together. 
an easy understanding. But there's some difficulties. So one is that with many of these types of tangible interfaces, there's a separation between the object and the display. You know, per, when people are sitting at the t tangible surfaces, they're looking at the projection screen on the wall there, and they're interacting on the table, or um, and, and they don't they, they don't have the 3D content floating in space like the 3D user interfaces I showed before. Also, it's difficult to change object properties. You know, you, you could have a tag that appeared on a on a, um, a videotape, but when you look at the tag and the tape, you don't know how much um, information is stored on there or um, it, what, what content's on there without having a computer being able to recognize it. So um, there's some advantages in, in that the, the user's hands used for interacting, which is very good. Um, you can use both virtual and real objects together. There's no need for special input devices. But the, as I said before, the interaction is mainly limited to 2D surfaces, and full 3D interaction is quite difficult. So about t um, 10 years ago, we developed a new metaphor called a tangible AR. And the idea with tangible AR is to support interaction that combines augmented reality and tangible user interfaces together. So essentially what you do is you use a tangible user interface metaphor for providing user input and the AR for providing the output. And what this means now is you can combine the display space and the task space. So you see here a picture on the right-hand side of a woman holding a card. And when she looks at the card, um, on top of the card, she sees the 3D content. And the card itself is a tangible input device. As, it, as she rotates the card around, she can see the content from different angles. Um, so this has a lot of advantages compared to just using uh, tangible user interfaces by themselves. One of the important things in, in this type of interface is to distinguish between time and space multiplex input devices. So uh, a space multiplex input device is where you have many devices with just one function. So a classic example is a, a real toolbox. If you have a real toolbox, then you know you have a hammer and a screwdriver and different tools, and they pretty much just do one thing, but they do it really well. And then the alternative to that is a time multiplex device, where you've got one device that has many functions. So the mouse is a, a good example of that. Um, when you have a mouse, you know, depending on the software you're using, it could be a gun in a game, it could be a, a, a typewriter in, in a word processor, it could be um, a a pen and a sketch program, and so it could be many different things depending on what you're using it for. So both of these have trade-offs. Generally, uh, space multiplex are, easy, are quicker to use because you just got to pick up the device so you can start using it, as opposed to the time multiplex where you've got to pick the device and then decide the mode it's going to be used in and then start using it. Um, but of course, you know, with Microsoft Word, there might be 300 or so different functions, and you, you know, you couldn't really imagine having a toolbox with 300 tools in it, and each one does one of those functions really well because it becomes too um, space inefficient. So when you're designing AR interfaces, you've got to decide in your head what's the trade-off between the space versus time multiplex part of your interface. So to show an example of that, one of the projects we worked on a long time ago is called Tiles. In this case, this is an example of a space multiplex interface where you had a number of real tiles, and the tiles are supposed to show one thing each. And these, this was a, a project to help design the interior of aircraft cockpit. So when you looked at um, the uh, physical tile, you'd see a, a virtual cockpit um, instrument appearing there. And then you can use other tiles to interact with it. So I'll show you this. Oh, I can't find the codec. Sorry about that. I just um, uploaded the file this morning. So we'll go on. Um, I have another thing to show you in, instead. So that one, if it had worked, would have shown when you put two tiles together, you can, um, uh, you can load new content. But um, there's more recent examples of, of a similar type of um, interface. So here's um, a co CoCube, which is a, a physical cube that um, uh, changes the virtual content it shows depending on which side of the cube you're looking at. And a company have adopted this idea, it's a company called Merge Cube, where you um, buy this real cube, and when you put it into your VR viewer, you can see an AR view using the camera on a cell phone, and the cube changes depending on what um, type of program you're using. So in this case, when the person looks at a cube, he sees a kind of octopus inside the cube. So let me show you this working. And this is a really good example of a space multiplex um, interface because the cube pretty much does one thing. So you can see in the headset here, that cube looked like a um, uh, Pac-Man game. And then other ones, he's making the octopus now, and now it looks like you're holding an octopus in your hand. And um, so this is a, a see-through, a video see-through AR example. And there's, you can hold a skull in your hand. And it's very easy to manipulate that because it's very easy to manipulate the real cube. But this is a very inexpensive type of user interface. So those are uh, space multiplex interfaces because they pretty much do one thing with one object. 
Now we can also look at time multiplex interfaces. This is where the objects change depending on uh, what mode they're in. And one of the early examples of that is a project we did um, called VOMA. And the idea of this project was to use a paddle to arrange um, content in, in a virtual building. So we had several parts. One was a, uh, a book. When you open the pages of the book, you could see furniture on the page of the book. Then you could use a real paddle to pull objects off the page of the book and put it into an empty room and, and arrange a 3D scene. But the paddle behavior changed depending on what mode it was in. So when, when, you, um, when you were picking up a piece of furniture, if there was no furniture on your paddle, then you put the paddle on top of the furniture, it would pick it up and hold it. But if you had furniture on your paddle and you shook the paddle, it would delete the furniture that was on there, so it changed. So let me show you an example of this working. So you can see here's the book here. And when you open it up, you see the furniture. And then on this other tracking symbol, you see empty room. And now you can pick up um, uh, objects with the paddle and arrange them on the thing. And there was um, uh, simple physics there, so you could push objects around using the paddle. And then um, it's very easy to pick and drop. So we basically had a CAD program here without using to use a mouse or keyboard. So if you want to find out new furniture, you just have to turn the page. So each page is like a menu on a, on a program. So you can see if we turn the page here, we'll find some more pieces of furniture. This is the page of chairs. So you can pick a chair if you want. And um, here goes the chair. And here's um, some rugs. Now when he picks this rug, he doesn't want it, so he throws it away. So by making a flicking gesture with your paddle, it make, makes the rug go away. And he puts this rug down, and he doesn't want that one either, so he hits it. And when he hits it, it goes away as well. So you can map different behaviors onto the paddles depending on what you want to do. So that's a nice example of using a paddle and a book together to have some interaction. In this case, because the behavior of the paddle changed at different times, it's an example of a space multiplex device. More recently, at the, um, the show this week, uh, you'll see the company Zapper. And Zapper have just released the Zapbox. And the Zapbox use, uh, implements room scale tracking. So you take these little circular symbols and you put them around the room. And, as, and then you put your mobile phone in, into a little uh, VR viewer. And as long as you can see one of these symbols, it'll track off it and create a video see-through uh, VR. And then they also have handheld controllers. So you hold these in your hand. And when you look at them, the controllers become different objects depending on what program you're using. And by doing that, they implement a tangible AR metaphor and let you have a very natural um, uh, mobile AR interaction. But it's very, very inexpensive because it's just cardboard and paper. So you can see here some examples of how that works. So here's a brain appearing floating in space. And you can take the controller, and the controller has a little fuse on it, and it lights the brain on fire, and it explodes um, and makes this little thing here. So if you can't afford to buy a HoloLens, I think these are about $100 for the kit. And you just put your mobile phone to a viewer and then you get this, um, not exactly the same experience, but a little bit similar uh, room scale um, AR. So you can see now in this hand, if he has a virtual hand onto the controller, now he can use things like uh, changing the color of objects he's um, selected, um, or play a musical instrument, um, or uh, play some, in this case, some mini golf. Um, so it's a very nice, again, nice enough of a tangible AR interface where you've got um, real physical objects that are, are custom made to um, map their task. So some of the advantages and disadvantages of this is, well, in this case, you have very natural interaction with the real and physical tools. Uh, and you can have spatial interaction with virtual objects. So you can interact with objects in the space and no longer on the table anymore. But the disadvantage is that most of these applications require some sort of head mount display so you can see the content wherever you are. More recently, what people have been looking at is trying to move away from that and support natural user interfaces. So have support for um, speech, uh, gesture, or body interaction with, with AR content. You know, you'd love to be able to see some sort of virtual content floating in space in front of you and just be able to reach out and grab it with your hands and move it around. And in fact, if any of you have done much AR before, um, even with Vuforia examples where the content is popping out of pages on, on the magazine or something, one of the first things people try and do is grab the content with their real hands when they see it, because it seems so real. So more recently, people have been developing technology that makes that possible. 
And the benefit of this is it supports interaction with no devices at all, and it also supports very implicit or intuitive uh, input. And it uses existing skills we already have. You know, humans have known for thousands of years how to use their hands to pull objects or remove objects. So you may as well use those same skills to interact in the real world. But there's some disadvantages. It's technically still quite difficult to be able to support freehand interaction with AR. And um, there's no constraints anymore. When you have a, a virtual interface that's projected on a table, you can use a table surface to provide a constraint where you can um, easily drag against. But when you've got objects floating in, in the uh, mid-air, mm -hmm. then there's no constraints anymore. So here's some examples of how you can do that. So um, uh, there are a number of companies now that are, are, are selling hand tracking or finger tracking with depth cameras. You can also get special gloves that detect when you're pinching the hands and fingers together. So about 20 years ago, uh, in one of the first wearable computing systems, uh, they took pinch gloves and put them into the system, so now you could do CAD modeling outdoors. So they had some simple hand tracking as air toolkit tracker, and now you knew where your hands were, and when you go outside, you could pinch your hands together and start um, creating uh, planes and building um, AR scenes. More recently, uh, Tobias's mm -hmm. group mm -hmm. at the um, at UCD, UCSD, UCSB sorry, have been looking at how you can mm -hmm. use natural mm -hmm. hand interaction with more complicated computer vision. So in this case, the Handy AR project used the hand as a reference coordinate frame, and then you could overlay AR content onto it. So you basically hold your hand in front of your, your face, look at it, and you'll see a virtual model appearing on your hand, and you can you rotate it around, just moving your hand around. So it gets away from the need to have the old, um, the old um, AR toolkit markers. So you see here, uh, they're using a fingertip tracking, and they've got the virtual content appearing in the palm of your hand. And because as you move your hand, the content rotates around, it becomes a very, very natural way to interact with the content. So um, now you can look at a bunny from different perspectives. And if you lose tracking, it recovers quite quickly as, again as well. So you can see um, the uh, fingertips being tracked with, with circles on them and another circle on the palm of the hand. And if you um, lose the hand, then it'll, it'll find it again very quickly. So th that was uh, quite simple tracking, but you can do more complicated as well. So uh, Microsoft a couple of years ago developed the Holodesk. And if you use a depth uh, sensor, you can actually capture the 3D shape of the hand. In this case, there was a, a, a monoscopic camera so it captured the 2D silhouette, but with a 3D shape, you can do more complicated interactions. So with the Holodesk, you had a semi-transparent mirror, and you looked through the mirror with a depth sensor, you could find the people's hands, and then you could have virtual content shown on the mirror that appeared to interact with the real hands. So you can see that um, here. So there's, there's hands going around, and if you look, here's the mirror here, and you'll see now it looks like he's playing with um, a couple of balls in his real hand. So when the person looks through the, the transparent mirror, they can see in 3D, and they get the illusion that they're really holding the balls in the palm of their hand. And they can easily interact with them just by reaching out and grabbing them. And there's also occlusion. So there's a, you can see there's a real object there that's occluding the virtual object. And they put the ball on the piece of paper. They can now put it in the cup. And then they flip, if they flip the cup over, they can cover up the ball with parts of the, um, parts of the uh, real cup. So he's now using his hands to stack objects. He can just reach out and pinch the objects and stack them. Um, so as I said before, this was basically using uh, a um, half silver mirror with a monitor on the top pointing down, and then also with a, a depth sensor, in this case the connect sensor. But you could use um, the real sense sensor or any of the other ones that are on the market um, right now. They also do some face tracking because they want to render the stereo. So if they track your eyes, they know exactly where to draw the view from. So you get a stereo image. And then there's the, um, the hand tracking as well. Of course, you can also scale up. And a number of people have done research on how you can use whole body input. And it's been very popular with games on Microsoft Connect and others that use whole body input into um, AR systems. So you can see this guy here is um, written a piece of software that adds special effects to his body. So now he's um, become like a superhero, and his hands, he goes in the air, and he makes a, a special gesture. And he can now um, do a Dragon Ball Z type um, energy blast. And the computer is um, tracking him. So as he 
launches the ball at different levels, it uh, has different amounts of energy. So that one's a lower energy blast because he launched at a lower level. And um, if he launches at a high level, then it, goes, it has a higher energy blast. And you can see his virtual hair changing depending on how much energy is in the ball. So the hair gets blown back. So that's uh, kind of superhero training, but that relies on whole body tracking um, using the Microsoft Connect. One of the areas that we're interested in is, is gaze and eye tracking. And there are a number of companies now that are building small eye trackers that can fit um, inside head mount displays. And so now um, you can know where the person's looking. This is, eye, eye tracking is a very important interaction method because people normally look at objects before they interact with them. So if you track their eyes, you get a very important uh, implicit cue wh where somebody's looking or paying attention to, and you know what they're about to do before they do it. Um, so here's a couple of examples of products that can be fitted onto the Microsoft HoloLens or HTC Vive, and this is what the eye tracking output looks like. If you don't have an eye tracker, you can um, do something similar by using head tracking and, and head pointing. And so that's what Microsoft does inside the Microsoft um, HoloLens, and you'll see that here. So as you look at things, um, they will uh, respond to you. So it's not really gaze selection because it's not tracking your eyes, but it's tracking your head position. And in, in most cases, you look in the same direction your head is facing, so it's good enough. So in this case, as they look around this virtual uh, field, they can use this to determine the point of attention and give some feedback. So here they, they've got a remote collaboration going on, and he wants to see where the person's looking, so they have a, a virtual line there. And what they do is they use the... Um, they make sure that the gaze cursor fits onto the virtual content where they're looking. But you can also use gaze to interact with menus in space and with other objects um, as well. So it's a very nice um, interaction um, method. So the final thing I want to talk about in terms of interaction is agent interfaces. And this is a much newer area of research. And the basic idea is that, is that um, if you're in an AR scene, you may want to have an um, intelligent agent to help you. You know, if you have your phone, you have Siri or maybe Cortona on, on your desktop. Um, but um, in AR, you could have something similar um, if you provide a virtual representation of it. So this allows you to have a virtual character that somehow helps you interact better in the real world. You can imagine, for example, using this to help you with assembling a real object, and you have a virtual character beside you that moved or pretended to move some of the virtual pieces around of that object, and then you could copy that to assemble the real object. So the agent basically represents an expert system that you can interact with, and then you can use natural communications with that. So you can use speech or gesture or gaze. So in much the same way as you can talk to Cortana now, you can talk to a virtual character and have it interact with you. So here's one very early example called, called Wellbo that was developed 20 years ago. In this case, um, this virtual character was floating in space, and you, you could give it speech commands and it would interact with the real world around you. You could say, go over by the sofa, and it would fly over by the sofa. Or you could say, how big is this object, and it would tell you how big the object was. More recently, some of Dita's students did a project on having an um, uh, animated Lego character to help you perform different tasks. So you can see on the bottom there is a little Lego character, and what the character does is it helps you assemble Lego models. So you see the um, character standing beside the real model, and it brings over virtual Lego pieces and, and shows you where they should go, and then you can replace the real Lego pieces with those as well. Great, so so far we've talked um, about different um, interface um, um, uh, approaches, going from very simple where you've just got a browsing interface and you use touchscreen on your phone, to very complicated where you're using speech and gesture to interact with content. What I want to speak about for the next 15 minutes is um, how you can design um, AR interfaces. Oh, there's a spelling mistake on the slide there. So um, in designing AR interfaces, it's quite different from designing other desktop systems or even VR systems, so I'll cover that quickly. So when you're designing an AR interface, there's um, three main components. So, of course, just like many other systems, there's um, some display elements. So there's some visual um, content, some audio content, or other content you've got in the um, AR experience. But what, one thing that's different about AR is, of course, the, the strong connection to the physical world. So in the, in the picture here, you can see, for example, a person holding up a piece of paper, and he sees a virtual um, BMW um, appearing on the piece of paper. So the user has the illusion that the virtual car is somehow glued onto the real piece of paper. So in this case, the physical component of this AR experience is the piece of paper. And when the person designed the experience, they had to think about what was the size of the paper going to be, what colors was going to print on the paper so it could track, and so forth. So you have the physical components of the display elements, and these are, these are connected together by an interaction metaphor. 
So in the previous uh, videos I showed you, you, you saw the paddle that was um, it became um, kind of a, a virtual crane that could move furniture. And the metaphor for that was that you had a, a, a book that allowed you to um, uh, be like God and, and kind of move uh, furniture around just using a sort of paddle object. So in a designer, you've you got to think about these three elements. How am I going to design physical components? How am I going to design the display elements? And how am I going to connect it together with an interaction metaphor? And so there are many, many different types of... Um, and this basically re re um, corresponds to input on the physical element side and output on the display side. And so there are many possible ways of, of capturing AR input, ranging from 2D pointing using mouse and trackpad all the way through to um, the cameras that recognize gestures and so forth. And similarly, um, I know in, earlier in the course, um, the guys already talked about display technology, so there's many ways of also showing AR output. Um, from um, projecting on walls or tables, um, head mount display, providing audio or haptic output. So um, when you start thinking about how these can be connected together, there are some important questions you need to ask yourself. So for, first of all, what is the physical element of the AR system? What, what real objects are you going to be having in, this, in the experience? What real environment you're working in? What devices are you going to use? Then what are the virtual elements? What is the graphics uh, I need to show? What audio content, maybe tactile or haptic content? And then how are they connected together? What's the metaphor I'm going to use? So in many ways, um, the AR interface design space is a blending between physical design and virtual design. So game designers and, and content designers are very good at building virtual objects and, and, and games or content on screens, but those same people oftentimes don't have the same experience in actually building physical objects. And so if you want to be a really good AR interaction designer, you've got to be able to think about both the physical world and the real world and how they blend together. Luckily, though, there's some really good guidelines for building physical objects. And um, one of the important um, elements of designing physical objects is this notion of affordances. And affordances is a term from psychology that basically re refers to the attributes of an object to, that let people know how to use it. So, for example, a door handle affords pulling because it's shaped so you can pull it, or a button affords a pushing. And one of the famous um, experts in the field is a guy called Don Norman, who wrote this book, The Psychology of Everyday Things. He's at uh, San Diego, and um, in his book he says the term affordance refers to the perceived and actual properties of a thing, primarily those fundamental properties that determine just how the thing could possibly be used. Affordance provides strong clues to the operations of things. The important uh, words here is perceived and actual. So for example, if you had a chair in the room, the chair affords sitting. The way the chair is shaped means I can sit on it. But if you had an invisible chair in the room, of course I could still sit on it, but I can't see it anymore. So now there's no perceived affordances. And similarly, sometimes you have things that look like they can work one way and they don't. So many of you may probably have seen, sometimes you go to a, a, a bank or some department store and they'll have a, a door with a bar there. And when you look at the bar, you may think, oh, well, it's a bar. I can push that to open the door. But actually, sometimes those doors are pull doors. And so in this case, you're perceiving that you can push the door to open it, but the actual affordance is to pull the door. So what they should do is replace those doors with door handles, bars of door handles, so when you naturally turn and pull. So, of course, with physical objects around us, there are many physical affordances. So you can see there's a door handle, like I said before, you can turn and pull, scissors, chairs, that show you how they can be used. Uh, similarly, um, in uh, virtual interfaces, there are also virtual affordances. This is why Apple made a trash can for, your t for you to delete files, or why we use sliders or buttons that look like 3D buttons, because they show people how to use. So one of the challenges of an AR designer is to think about what physical um, components I need to have in my interface that will show people how to use it right. So when we did the, the furniture application, this is why we made the paddle the shape it was, because um, it was very easy for people then to use it to naturally scoop objects up and pick them or move them. So AR really is a, is a mixture of physical affordance and virtual affordance design. And the physical affordances generally re re refer to the tangible controllers and the real objects in the scene, whereas the virtual affordances are the virtual graphics and audio. So let me give you some examples of, of how you can um, uh, design uh, for that. So as I said, there are three parts to an AR interface. There's um, the physical components, the display elements, and the interaction metaphors. So, and when you're thinking about building an AR system, you need to think about what are those three things going to be. So let me show you a couple of examples. 
So one of these is, is the idea of a magic lens. So a magic lens is a, um, a graphic interface where you can um, have something in your hand that looks like a magnifying glass or a lens, and when you move it over the object, it shows something different. So in this case, for example, you've got a, a body, um, or an, and then when you move the lens over, you can see inside the body and you can see a skeleton. So this is really great because it means you can see the focus of area of interest, which is a skeleton, but you can see it in the context of the whole body. So when you're designing this from a physical perspective, you can think of what are the physical components going to be. So in this example, we had uh, the physical components were going to be a tracking uh, piece of paper and a real mouse with a little tracking symbol tied to it. And then what are the display elements? So in this case, we wanted to have a virtual globe appearing on the tracking symbol and also a magnifying glass appearing in the handheld thing. And the interaction metaphor, so the interaction metaphor in this case was that you're holding a magnifying glass lets you see um, uh, the Earth and different properties of the Earth. So here's another example um, of a house. So when you look at the house, you can see inside the house. So I've got a video of this working here, so you can see. So here's the, um, the, the physical elements. Um, this is a special ring mouse that has a, a, a trackball on it for buttons. And um, then uh, you can manipulate that around really easily. Um, so this is, again, an old system. So we use the AI toolkit marker. But of course, you re-implement this now with Euphoria, where you can actually track the object shape. And now here, you've got this um, lens used, being used for magnification. So when you move it over, you can see you're seeing a magnified view of the house um, through the lens. But again, you've got that focus and context view. So it becomes very intuitive and natural for the person to use this, because it mimics an object they're familiar with. You know, everybody's familiar with a real magnifying glass. This is an example of the Earth. So as he moves it over the Earth, then the areas inside the lens uh, become colored differently. So here, he's looking at um, height maps in the Earth. And, and um, then when we go to the next little piece, you'll see uh, this is the Earth at night. So you can see the lights of the various cities. Um, and so forth. So that's one example. A second example is a really great art project that was done a few years ago called Levelhead. And this is a block-based game. So again, we have to think about physical components, display elements, interaction metaphor. So the physical components in this case are real uh, blocks you can hold in your hand. Display elements, what you're showing in those blocks is a virtual person in a room. And the metaphor is that you're holding a small house in the palm of your hand. And as you turn the room around, it makes the person start walking. And then, um, in this case, the goal is to try and get the person to escape from the house. So here you can see the AR scene, um, the block in your hand, and you can see a little white person there, and each face of the block has a different room in it. So let me show you this, this working. Uh, so you see, here's the block. And when you look at the block, you get the impression that you're looking inside a 3D space. So they've done a very nice job with the AR content to create the illusion that you're looking inside a hollow space. And each face of the block has a different room in it. And there's the person there. And as you tilt the block, it's, it starts moving in the direction that you're tilting. So if you want the person to move in a certain direction, you tilt the block up and the person moves around. And there's, each of the rooms has a door in it, so they, uh, or several doors, so he can, he can get out. And so the goal of the, of the puzzle is to try and get the person to escape from this um, building. So now he's trying to find the uh, person again. And there he is looking down top. So as he tilts the building, the person moves in the direction of the tilt. So he's going to try and get the person to walk down the stairs. Now he walks off in the distance. So you can see it's a very nice, again, tangible mapping. The final example I want to show you is in, from chemistry. In this case, this is interesting because they want to build an application that allow people to build molecules. But by using the same tracking library, AI Toolkit, but they use it in different ways on different devices, and they map the device form factor to the, how it's being used. So again, so the goal was to learn molecular structure. You had real components. In this case, you had a real book. You've got a cube for rotation. You've got a special kind of paddle that scoops things up. So tracking markers, then you've got display elements that are atoms and molecules, and the metaphor is that you can build your own molecule by, by uh, um, scooping up atoms. So here's the objects. So you can see it's the same tracking system on all the objects, but they change the shape depending on what they're going to be. So the, the book there holds the periodic table, and as you turn the pages of the book, you see a different atom. The paddle there on the right-hand side lets you scoop atoms up, and then the cube on the bottom right is used to rotate models together. And by 
using these together, you can basically pick an atom from the page of the book and you can shoot it over to this tracking symbol and start building a molecule. So let me show you this um, working. You can see they've got a kind of projection screen AR, so he's looking in the screen here, and he's got a camera below the screen which is tracking the cubes, and then he can now interact with the um, material. So it's a, it's a two-handed device, so he can be scooping up atoms with one hand, and at the same time be, be um, viewing and interacting with the molecules with, with the other hand. So um, you can see on, on the um, front there is kind of a triangular molecular structure, and um, there's some empty spots in the triangle, so you can um, attach atoms to that and, and using, quick, using a ball and stick model quickly build a, a molecule. So this is a really nice example of designing physical shapes that exactly map the needs of what the interface has. You know, you couldn't use the scooper in the wrong way because it's the way it's shaped. And similarly the cube, you can't really use the cube to scoop up objects is the way it's shaped. So that's some examples of interaction metaphors and, and, and how you have to, uh, basically in your mind when you're designing an interface, think of those three things, the physical objects, the virtual objects, and most importantly, how they connect together. Now, of course, there are also some good design guidelines you can apply as well. And because AR interfaces are just a variant of computer interfaces in general, then there's some very good general rules. So, for example, one of the base, most basic rules of HCI design is that you need to have some sort of good conceptual model or metaphor. So when the user understands that the paddle can move atoms, it becomes very easy for them to interact with the objects in the correct way. Secondly, you need to be able to make things visible. So if the object has some function, the interface should show it. You need to ha ha consider the user context. So for example, if you're building a mobile AR system, like a game, then um, many times people might be using their mobile phone outdoors. And so can they play your game while walking down the street or while crossing the street and try to avoid cars and things like that? So consider the context of use. Um, you need to find, provide feedback all the time. So these are very basic guidelines that apply to any computer interface, not just AR. But there are also some AR-specific guidelines, and this guy, Manix uh, Kikert, produced some really nice guidelines uh, for, ho for HoloLens, but they can be applied in general. And so a couple of them is uh, to know what you show. So it's basically designed for the limitations of your system. If you have a, a bad tracking system, then you can design around that. Um, make your user interface spatial, so focus on putting objects in space, make it usable, design with a 3D um, mindset. So in this case, he said that you know, many uh, computer interface designers come from a graphic arts background. They're very good at doing 2D layout on the screen. But for AR, it's more about product design. It's more about thinking about 3D objects and 3D structure and being an architect and designing spaces. So some examples of that know what to show. Um, one of the limitations with the um, HoloLens is that it's very difficult to show black content. So in this case, the way to get around that is to use very bright images and not show any try any black, and use dark colors in the images to simulate black. The whole lens has good tracking, but it's not perfect. So in um, good interfaces that are using it, they try and uh, use um, occlusion or support dynamic environments. And similarly, the whole lens has a limited field of view, so you need to be able to have ways to guide people to your interaction point. So. Um, this is the fantasy versus reality. Many times when, when Microsoft first released HoloLens, they had these pictures like on the top left-hand corner here, and they saying when you put the HoloLens on, your whole field of view is going to be filled with graphics. But actually the reality is the HoloLens has a very small field of view. So we, from a design perspective, you've got to think about how can I design so that I draw people's attention um, to draw their small view window to the attention where it needs to be. In terms of making the user interface um, spatial, you need to provide feedback to all user input, which shows the system's working. Uh, so you know, when the user does something, the system should re recognize it and respond in some way. Um, you need to look at having a, a, a spatial interface, so 3D objects as opposed to a 2D hub. Look at using gesture and gaze input and also placing user interface elements near the center of view. Again, small field of view, the UI element should come into the middle. Designing with a 3D mindset means you need to think about the content you're providing. So you can see here, um, uh, on the TV clips that show HoloLens, they show this little virtual person that looks like they're a solid person, you can't see through them. But the reality is, when you're wearing a HoloLens, you see through everything. So you have to decide, do I want to try and blend the person with the background and make it 50% op opaque? Do I make the person very, very bright and wash them out? Or do some sort of screen blending? So you have to decide how you're going to represent the objects. And similarly, when you're building a user interface, how do you, um, what, how do you represent the interface in, in 3D? So to show you a couple of examples of that, 
First of all, I'm going to show you the Holo Studio application. Holo Studio is, is a basically a 3D scene assembly program, and this allows you to build um, 3D um, uh, uh, 3D objects or assemble 3D objects. So this, uh, as you watch this video, you should see the um, um, very interesting design distortions they made. Early on in, in the HoloLens program, we got really excited about creativity. You know, we said, man, we get to build or make holograms on a daily basis. Why don't we enable the world to do that? And that is the genesis of Holo Studio is, you know, let's let people create their own holograms. Holo Studio is the fast and simple workshop for creating your own delightful holograms. It puts computing back out into the physical world. With Holo Studio, we're kind of giving creators new ways to, to create with 3D, to create with characters, and really explore a different way of interacting with 3D content. It's a lot to wrap your head around when you're trying to build 3D objects on a 2D screen. With HoloLens, we let you build 3D objects in 3D. So when you have a real holographic thing that's there and you can walk around it and it feels like a real object, it just totally changes the relationship between the creator and, and their creation. So that's Holo um, Studio, and one of the things you notice from that is that all of the objects had, were, were ripped into 3D objects. So the paint tool, for example, was a, was a, a spray can and so forth. So they had this nice uh, 3D user interface that was floating beside them that they could use. It looked like a real toolbox, and they could use the real tools to assemble um, objects and, and color them. And the last thing I want to show you, though, is some very interesting um, learnings they had from doing that. And so in this little short video clip, they provide some um, user interface guidelines for people who are building AR interfaces. Holo Studio was a pioneer app for HoloLens, and as such, we didn't have any best practices for 3D UI and interaction design. So we had to figure things out through user testing, prototyping, and a lot of trial and error. We know that not everybody has the resources at their disposal to do this type of research, so we wanted to share some of the top issues we had with UI design on HoloLens during the development of Holo Studio. Hall Studio originally had a rectangular workbench, much like you find in the real world. But the problem is that people have a lifetime of experience telling them to stay still when they're seated in front of a desk and using a computer, so people weren't really moving around and exploring their creation. We had the insight to change the table to be round, so there's no clear front or place that you were supposed to stand, and all of a sudden people started walking around and exploring their creations on their own. So think about what's comfortable for the user. Taking advantage of the physical space is a cool feature of HoloLens, and something you can't do with many other devices. So, one of the problems is that users might be looking in a different direction than something that needs their attention in your app. Now, on a PC, you can just pop up a modal dialogue, but when you pop up a dialogue in front of somebody's face, it can feel like there's something that's getting in their way, and you want them to read the message, but they just kind of want to get away from it. So we turned our dialogues into a thought bubble system, and we added tendrils that users could follow to where their attention was needed in our application. We also made the tendrils pulse, and that implied a sense of directionality so users knew where to go. It's much harder in 3D to alert users to things they need to pay attention to. So using attention directors like spatial sound, light rays, and thought bubbles can help lead users to where they need to be. Sometimes users need to interact with a hologram that's actually behind another hologram, which unfortunately blocks the UI. So to keep the UI visible, we tried moving it close to the user so it couldn't get blocked. But then it wasn't comfortable to look at a UI that was near while simultaneously looking at a hologram that was far away. If, however, we moved the UI in front of the closest hologram to the user, it felt like it was detached from the hologram that it was actually affecting. We finally ghosted the UI, and this puts the UI at the same distance as the hologram it's affecting, so they feel like they're connected, and it allows the user to interact with the UI, even though it's been obscured. Users need to be able to easily access controls, even if they've been blocked. So figure out methods to ensure that users can complete their tasks, no matter where their holograms are in the real world. So it's a couple of guidelines from Microsoft to own the HoloLens team. So just to wrap up, so what I've talked about today is that when you're designing um, AR interfaces, you have to think about the physical elements, the virtual components, interaction metaphors, and there are many interface metaphors to choose from. And I've shown examples of you know, using a browser um, information, browsing um, interface, tangible AR, natural user interfaces, and so forth. So here are my contact details and um, email.
Twitter account, and these slides will go up online um, as well. So I think what we're going to do now is transition to the last session for the last half an hour, which is about uh, future research directions. And are we going to run that off your laptop, Tobias? So, yeah. Great. So I'll step aside, and we're all three of us are going to present during that time. Um, I, do you want to take some questions first for this, or just keep on going? Sure, cool. Yeah. So does anybody have any questions before we go into the last session about user interfaces or interaction for AR? Nope. This is all in the book as well, so of course you can read that and get a really great overview of that too. Great. So let me um, pass over to Tobias and then... The last section is, uh, is highly interactive in the case. Yes. Uh, An interaction will uh, show up again. So... All right, for our last part, we kind of um, uh, want to summarize uh, the presentations uh, from the day and uh, extrapolate all the um, developments uh, uh, with a, uh, a look into the future. And uh, um, in terms of summary, uh, this is uh, some of the, uh, the content you have seen. Um, from definition of augmented reality to the key enabling technologies, uh, we displace tracking technologies, interaction technologies. In between, uh, we had uh, uh, rendering technologies and um, cohesive uh, lighting. Um, let's look at uh, uh, each of these big challenges uh, in turn. So that's, I think, how, uh, uh, how Mark uh, um, structured it. Evolution and displace from the past to the current to the future. If you extrapolate the uh, um, developments there, you, you, can, you can actually see some major roadblocks in the size of the display um, and in uh, the, uh, uh, the limiting factors that uh, we still have in terms of uh, uh, accommodation virgins mismatch, um, like resolution, uh, field of view, uh, and several others. Uh, so a few observations uh, that you want to actually come up uh, um, that uh, 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 kind of uh, like go through this area is that uh, um, wide field of view, see-through displays are currently in development but haven't really hit the market yet. And uh, the technologies that, uh, that are the basis of this are um, Light field displays, as I covered in the session uh, uh, earlier today. There's, uh, I think, two examples that Mark put together here. Um, one is uh, uh, here NVIDIA's effort um, of, uh, that actually is a really good example of, of uh, um, uh, one way of achieving light fields. Uh, so you get, can actually see getting close to this near eye display. And uh, the closer you get, you get a focused view of this, uh, this text here. The way this works is uh, uh, micro lenses, uh, lots of micro lenses actually uh, uh, live on the display. And uh, each of them actually uh, uh, captures the light that, that was, uh, um, so each of them plays back the light that was captured uh, from a different, slightly different perspective and angle. And by the uh, uh, overlay of all these different uh, uh, captured uh, light um, beams, uh, you get a uh, reconstruction of the light field uh, to your eye. So this is one way of actually playing back a light field. This is not the only uh, um, so the technology. Key, the key thing it. from this is a pin light display on your better battery is um, that with a, this display, they were able to build a 110 degree wide field of view optical see-through display. So basically three times the field of view of the whole lens. Um, in a form factor that looks like a pair of glasses. And just this week, Microsoft um, showed a, their own version of this um, using um, a waveguide display that also very wide field of view. So I showed that uh, you already. OK, great. Um, one of the other um, more exciting examples is a retinal display. In this case, uh, you can use a small scanner to scan photons directly into the eye and build a, a very wide field of view display with no physical display elements. So this was first developed um, by my PhD advisor in the mid-90s and commercialized by Microvision. But one of the people on that team then went ahead and formed uh, Ma Magic Leap. And so this is one of the technologies that Magic Leap is doing using um, f to build their display, is to build uh, retinal, using retinal scanners. And then further afield, of course, we're, we're all heading... Yep? That's right. So is this, is it, 
Yeah. So basically, you're looking at a laser beam. So you've got a laser beam that hits a small mirror, and the mirror scans left and right and up and down, and scans an image directly on the back of the eye. So the image is only formed on the back of the eye. So there's no physical display element. Unlike, you know, if you've got an LCD panel or something else, in your, in your, which has a lot, of different, a lot of benefits. So for example, it can be made very bright, very small, um, and, and so forth. With a bundle of uh, uh, fiber uh, uh, optics, you, you can actually uh, uh, project the, uh, the, the image at different depths, thereby uh, um, kind of uh, addressing the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the focus problem that, that we talked about earlier today. Yeah. Can you discuss, discuss Go. how the res uh, resolution thing, it's like the infinite resolution? That exactly, that? yep. And you can make a true 3D display, so you can adapt which, which what Madley's been working on. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, one, a person came to our lab who was blind in one eye. When they used this device, they could see in their blind eye because the um, eye had cornea damage, but the retina was perfectly fine. So if they could shoot the image through the cornea and onto the retina. So there's a lot of benefits of this approach. Of course, one of the things that could be very exciting is contact lenses, and there is some work being done. The back carvers at the University of Washington developed one of the first contact lens displays um, uh, 10 years ago. Um, and so this is basically an active display you put in your eye. Um, it was very low resolution, 8 by 8 pixels. Um, another approach is to use a, 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 a very um, an, a passive contact lens you put in your display in your eye to focus your eye very close and then have an active display, a micro display in front of your eye, a pair of glasses. And that's what the company Innovega um, does as well. So, so I think this is worth a, a quick discussion, sure. uh, actually. Um, uh, the, so the solution, uh, the Innovega solution is out and you can try it, uh, but it does require a contact lens and a near eye display, which is probably not socially acceptable. Uh, uh, the kind of dream of, of, of having a contact lens that does it all in one is I think, uh, um, I mean, we need to solve some, some, some really uh, hard uh, problems before that actually can happen. Because uh, um, you, you have to actually have the, the power supply like linked to the contact lens as well. So how is that going to work? Uh, um, the optics as well, if you do it, the optics alone, just, just the contact lens, like will require a certain thickness that is also not quite clear right now physically how you can do it. So there are currently seemingly insurmountable problems with this approach, but uh, uh, there's always a new scientific solution for something. Yes. So the, uh, um, the combination of the contact lens that actually just lets certain polarized light from the near eye display through uh, allows uh, uh, the, the focus to a very, very close by display surface. So that combination actually proved viable. But that has acceptance problems. So, so it's an interesting uh, development. It's a long way. And of course, with Babak's uh, solution, you have to get FDA approval and so forth. So it's at least 10 years or 15 years away from being um, uh, viable. Yeah. Do you want me to talk about this? Sure. About okay, sure. so, um, well, there's actually some of your content later. Yeah. I'll let you talk to that. <laughs> so, of course, um, we've seen a big evolution of tracking over the last 20 years as well. So, in the past, um, simple marker-based tracking. In the present, now we have image-based tracking like with Euphoria. In the future, we're moving towards more model-based and ubiquitous and environmental tracking. So here's some examples of model-based tracking where you can track from um, known 3D models. Um, and some of the recent innovations are that you can, as you saw today, I guess, Euphoria talked about their own um, object-based tracking where you could submit a CAD model, get the tracking file back and start tracking from the model. Uh, you can also track from cluttered scenes or from deformable objects. So here's, a pic here's an example of tracking from a piece of paper that's being um, bent and moved um, around. And um, you, now people are, are doing face tracking or body tracking from deformable objects. Uh, one of the exciting innovations is being able to track from the environment and using depth sensors to um, scan the environment, but in a way that um, uh, has smart memory management so that you can then create a very large scan. So the uh, people from the University of Oxford had developed the Infinite AM software that provides real-time scene capture on uh, mobile devices using a simple depth sensor. And that allows you to scan uh, very large air areas. So you can see here uh, the infinite time working. So the, um, the two panels on the right, the top one is the, is the depth um, image. The bottom one is the color image that you're getting. And on the left-hand side, the gray panel, is the uh, 3D model being generated in real time. So you can just wave the sensor around the room and it starts generating the model. And as you rescan different parts of the room, it, it builds the model more accurately. So I saw these guys give a demo in a conference about a year and a half ago where they took their sensor, they walked down the front row of the audience 
and within 30 seconds that digitized the whole front row of the audience as a 3D model. So it's a really amazing approach to doing environmental um, scene capture. And of course you can track from this once you've, you've captured it. Um, more recently, Sharam is out at Microsoft and now he's left to go to Perceptive.io. Mm -hmm. He's, and in this, in this case, of course, the room is a fixed structure, but in this case, with Fusion 4D, they can track from dynamic um, uh, changing objects, so using um, uh, RGBD sensors and uh, incremental reconstruction. So what you'll see here is them capturing people as they're moving, and um, by having multiple sensors and by um, using smart reconstruction, they can build... Oh, I do too. Yeah. You'll see them... Uh, capturing uh, clothing and, and body motion. So here's a guy doing Taekwondo or something, and you can see on the bottom right the captured um, uh, person there. So this is really amazing because it means now you can capture um, clothing and dynamic motion and it doesn't have to be a static a person. So you can see surrounding him is multiple um, depth sensors. And what happens is you get this a point cloud um, that's really noisy and then you uh, filter it and uh, do a real-time construction for the multi-view. You can combine the color and the, the depth together and um, it provides that output. So I'll fast forward a little bit because we don't have much time. So this is a pretty intense uh, uh, setup though. So a lot yeah, of, uh, of uh, high-end cameras, a lot of compute power, uh, but with all that, it actually, with lots of uh, um, parallel um, GPU computing approaches, it, it actually does pull it off. So look at, look at the dress on this model, for example, how well it captures the motion of the, of the clothing and stuff. So this is a really amazing way of doing some sort of remote presence applications where you want to capture somebody and create the illusion that they're in a remote location. And then this is Tobias's work, so maybe you can talk about this. this is some amazing work he did five years ago to do very large-scale um, outdoor uh, tracking. So Yeah, so that's, uh, that's really a, another frontier, uh, and you saw that today in the tracking session. Uh, how do you actually uh, enable uh, tracking in large environments uh, so that you don't have to really do anything to prepare the environment? In this case, so this was, uh, as uh, Mark said, five years ago, we had a simple approach where we uh, had to prepare the environment, but we made it as simple as possible. So this is uh, my PhD student, Jonathan Ventura's work. Uh, he is now a professor at University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. So here we just had to walk through an environment, hold up the Sony bloggy camera, and then from that, uh, uh, we actually, with structure from motion, uh, generated a point cloud like that. And once we had the point cloud, we could then uh, track uh, on a sim simple iPad. Uh, and get an augmented reality experience in the uh, um, uh, environment. So, so things like that are now out of the box possible with SLAM with the HoloLens. But the question still remains, how do you cover larger areas? So with the HoloLens, you actually build up a small model at a time. It doesn't really work in bright sunlight. Um, uh, so, so how do you maintain tracking over large areas and then send your data back uh, to a server where maybe a worldwide model uh, uh, comes up? And, and for that, it needs to basically be crowdsourced. You need to make use of any information that comes in from different clients. And uh, on a server, on a cloud, in the background, you actually uh, um, integrate all this. And so uh, we showed you a first step towards this uh, with Dita's work that uh, um, uh, basically started with 2D maps and, uh, and tracked from that as a resource. So you can see that as uh, ubiquitously uh, available, um, like 2D representation of a large scene. And if you combine that now with all these incoming new uh, poses and videos and uh, uh, images from uh, lots of users, then you can imagine that uh, uh, maybe a worldwide uh, augmented reality system is in reach. And that's actually a, a kind of the future outlook, how to do that and what entity out there would be interested in, uh, in doing that. There's lots of them that, that, that actually go in that direction, right? Interaction, handing back to, uh, so to Mark. The last um, area of innovation is interaction. So you can see in the past, as I, as I just talked about, you had very limited interaction with um, just a viewpoint manipulation. And now a lot of the um, AR devices have um, screen-based interaction where you tap on a screen on your mobile phone or simple tangible interaction where you can um, uh, move a block or something. And, and But the future now is looking at more gesture, multimodal input, um, intelligent interfaces and using physiological and sensor cues. So, for example, um, within the next couple of years, you'll be able to have access to very rich natural hand interaction. And I showed you some examples earlier, but these, in many cases, were quite simple, like what, what Tobias did a long time ago. But there are companies now working on 
much more effective hand tracking system. So here's the system for Microsoft that um, was really shown a year ago. And in this case, um, they do um, hand tracking. You can see here, the key difference from this though is that they, that they build a 3D model of the hand at very long distances away, very fast, and they support things like, or overcoming things like hand occlusion and some things that would have caused that to fail in the past. So you can see using that, the person can use their real hand to interact, in this case he's uh, DJing in, in VR, I guess, to interact with uh, VR and AR scenes um, in, in a very natural way. And the hand tracking works over quite a long distance, so the person's now maybe three or four meters from the screen or the sensor, and they're still able to provide very natural hand input. Now, hand motion by itself is very interesting, but there are certain things hands aren't very good at. So one of the areas of research that we've been working on is um, multimodal input. And this is where you combine gesture and speech together. So gestures in general is good for, for qualitative input, being able to grab objects and move them around and, and, and change uh, uh, qual qual qualities. Whereas speech is good for quantitative input. So for example, if you want to specify a number, it's better to use speech than somehow hold fingers up in the air or something like that. And, and they also support combined commands. So I can point at something and say, put that there, or make that object bigger. And by using speech and gesture together, then it, it provides more powerful input. So a few years ago at the Hit Lab, we developed a system that combined 3D hand tracking and speech together. And we did a user study to show that this allowed people to complete tasks faster than either one by itself. So you'll see here, uh, where's your volume control on your, uh, your, your fancy? You have to plug it in first then. Oh, uh, well. Oh, so. Oh, yeah, I wasn't using that before, was I? Probably never heard anything. But anyway, how do I turn your volume on? Is it. Ah, you've got your fancy touch bar. That's oh, right. look at that. Wow. So. Nothing's coming out. Interesting. It's probably all going through the HDMI or something. Yeah, so maybe so it's a bit. not working. But anyway, what you should be seeing is this is a, a simple uh, scene assembly program. But he's using sp speech commands to um, change different modes. So, for example, um, he will um, say rotate, and then he rotates his real hand, and the whole all the scenes start rotating. Um, or um, uh, so, yeah. I guess we can't hear the audio, but anyway. And then um, uh, one of the other projects we've been working on is intelligent user interfaces. So, how can you? Combine, uh, you know, we've seen many examples of augmented reality training systems where they have step by step guides to doing something, but in many cases, the system doesn't recognize what you're doing or give active feedback. So, in our system, we have an expert system at the back end and it monitors what you're doing and tells you when, you, when you're performing wrong. And by doing that, we, could, we found that we could complete a training task 30% faster than with using another approach, an AI approach without that. So, what you see in this case, for example, is a um, scene assembly. For a PC, and um, they can't find the video. Oh, I should. Well, what you should be seeing is a person tries to assemble a PC but does it wrong, and the system is tracking all the PC parts. And when they put a part in the wrong place, it gives graphical feedback to tell them it's incorrect. So that's everything I prepared. Um, basically, taking those um, those um, three main areas of AR: the display, tracking, and interaction and imagining what they would be like in the next five to ten years' time. Um, I think you had a couple more slides, but I'm not sure you want to take some questions, or what would you like to do now, Dita? Um, We've got about ten minutes left, I guess, before... I think I'll just do a little bit, and then we'll take questions. Yeah, so we are... Ten minutes, so um, now let me just step through that again. So um, let me maybe start, start with this. So we, we had a, a bit of uh, historical observations in the beginning. And of course, you can use the trajectory from the past to, to try and extrapolate into the future. Um, and uh, the interesting question is for augmented reality or mixed reality, this trajectory is not quite as clear as it is for VR. Uh, VR has uh, definitely found its market now in the in the extension of uh, conventional gaming systems, and since there is a big market for computer games, there one can speculate or one can even see uh, the first uh, results of uh, of this uh, of this growth in in this area. Um, whereas for augmented reality, it is not quite as clear. The potential application cases are much much more wide-reaching, and I think Tim Cook just said that, that he loves VR, but AR is going to be much, much bigger, much, much greater, but in how far or for what? Yeah? 
uh, what is the application area uh, for AR. I mean, I'm speculating that it's not going to be primarily gaming. I think the gaming will come later. Um, and uh, it's going to be more uh, professional, industrial, and productivity applications first. But we should not overlook um, the, uh, the implications that augmented reality also has for, um, for uh, the, 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 the personal space and the, um, the entertainment space. Um, and uh, one way to look at that is uh, to look at augmented reality as a new kind of medium or even a dramatic medium. So uh, when w in the past uh, century maybe, we've seen the introduction of new media technology. Um, and uh, a new medium has uh, new characteristics and uh, the best uh, way to express this is uh, when you look at the beginnings of film which was really poor. It was more or less uh, stage recordings. They didn't know how to produce film. They didn't know what a cut was, what a crossfade was, what the flashback was, and so on. And then, then came Citizen Kane and some other seminal movies that, that brought that vocabulary into the new medium. And if we see augmented reality as a new kind of medium, which I would argue it certainly is, uh, then its specific characteristic is now that it combines the real and the virtual. Uh, let's again go by these three properties. Uh, so that would imply for, uh, for drama that uh, you can now display the content anywhere, and this is a freedom that you're winning over conventional formats such as, let's say, uh, broadcast TV. Um, and the second property, the fact that augmented reality is spatially registered means that the audience is now free to choose the viewpoint. And that's actually one aspect that is sharing with VR as a dramatic medium that people now don't know how to tell stories when the user could be looking anywhere and missing the action, basically. And the third property, it's interactive in real time. Um, so unlike VR, uh, in, in AR, you will always be interacting with some kind of physical space. You can't and you won't remove the physical space, and you have to incorporate that into the experience. Huh? And, and as a result, uh, augmented reality, as we develop apps or content for it, will also require establishing new conventions. Uh, so, for example, how can we uh, maintain narrative focus while we are allowing for a free camera control for the user? Um, in games, even in VR games, we are seeing uh, use of cutscenes, for example, for storytelling, where the interactivity is taken away from the, from the user. In AR, you can't do that. Uh, so in, in some sense, going back to the beginning, AR is more like a theater stage on which we can uh, put content now, and that is going to, to open up really interesting uh, perspectives for, for this use of a medium. Um, and then if we go one step further, um, a medium is, of course, a communication medium. It is not only uh, for consumption, it is also intended for expression. Uh, so this content uh, that we use in AR will be provided by either professionals, that would be the case where on the other side you have these consumers, the, 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 the audience, the listeners. Um, so professionals would be like journalists, like story writers, and so on. Uh, but it could also be authorities, let's say traffic authorities, or uh, other kind of, uh, of uh, organized entities. Uh, and finally, of course, individuals. There's this whole dimension of, uh, of social communication, of social media, that will also find its place in AR. Uh, Mark has shown uh, this one example with the virtual graffiti. So, uh, uh, this is a recurring topic that you might, you know, message to each other in a spatially registered way. Um, so that will require not only geolocation, but a precise spatial annotation going much beyond what Pokemon Go is offering today. Now, where you, you and your friend might not even see the same Pokemon in the same place, even though you're standing side by side. Um, and then... Uh, um, this has to be organized, and I'm kind of speculating that the web model might be a good model to, uh, for, this, uh, for this content part, um, where we can introduce the equivalent of web links, but now between virtual and real. We can introduce channels or blogs or feeds where information can be structured and organized. Uh, 
uh, all in a specially referenced way. Um, and, in the, and we end up with, an, with, with, you know, we had this concept of always on. So this is a, a, a sort of pers pervasive interface. It must be context driven where location and registration is one of the sources of context and it's going to be a non-linear presentation of this information content. And if we do that, we really arrive at a new uh, uh, pervasive medium uh, that may be just as powerful as what the smartphone has become today with its Facebook app and its Twitter and whatnot. Um, yeah, so uh, in addition, um, I, I have to give uh, uh, Tobias credit for, for uh, adding this idea. We're going to also see a confluence of virtual and augmented reality. I mean, technically, you are at, a, uh, at an event that is presenting both augmented and virtual reality technology because both are growing and both share a lot. Um, there's this middle ground between AR and VR, sometimes called augmented, augmented virtual reality, where almost everything is virtual and you can't really tell the difference anymore. As you uh, progress in acquiring in real time everything about the real world, then at some point um, a virtual reality that feeds on top of this real time uh, world capturing becomes indistinguishable from, uh, from um, the, the reality and in a sense the, the whole continuum of mixed reality collapses into one. It doesn't matter anymore uh, whether the source is real or virtual. And uh, uh, that kind of leads to the situation that probably you all know if you've seen the matrix, do you take the red pill or the blue pill? Are you still in reality or in the, this kind of virtual reality? Uh, and it's, it's gonna be increasingly hard to tell, uh, but that is also a sort of a, a not, not only a, a dystopic idea, but it's also powerful because finally we can uh, make use of all the context that we have. Uh, and uh, that is maybe a good, uh, conclusion point and uh, at, uh, at this point we would probably like to take some more questions. That sounds good. While you're thinking about your questions please uh, do uh, bring them up. Uh, since we talked about science fiction let me just bring up uh, one last part that also came up this morning. Uh, let's see. I just wanted to conclude on A few visions of uh, uh, AR from science fiction uh, that have uh, kind of an overlap with uh, the display technologies that we have uh, kind of surveyed here. One is uh, the cave, which is the holodeck, right, uh, uh, from Star Trek. It also has some elements of uh, spatial augmented reality where you actually project uh, uh, onto uh, physical objects. Because uh, what comes out, for those of you who really don't know Star Trek The Next Generation anymore, is that all these scenes here are actually played out in like an empty room with calibration patterns, and that's the holodeck. And uh, it's just uh, like fantasies of Lieutenant Barkley in this case. The second uh, one we already discussed this morning as well is the brain-computer interface, right? So we have the... the the uh, cave, the brain-computer interface, which is the matrix, that uh, makes all the uh, uh, experiences just apparent to you uh, by being fed directly into your brain by an evil alien race that just uses you as battery power. Nine, uh, pretty dystopian. And then um, the last one, oops, uh, I thought I had uh, the near eye display in here as well, but instead I have uh, a 3D user interface. This is from a, uh, um, uh, a short by uh, um, Bruce Brennett called The World Builder that you can find on YouTube, which uh, basically uh, gives you a little story around lots of uh, very intuitive uh, uh, 3D um, interaction mechanisms that you could use to uh, uh, like build these large-scale environments. Okay, so uh, uh, that's our um, presentation for the day. Uh, any questions for any of us? Yeah, room lights would be great. Yes? How far away are we from the blue pill, not knowing the difference between the blue and the red pill? 
So the so Dieter had a uh, um, uh, keyword on the last slide called the visual Turing test, uh, and uh, uh, so so this this test has been made on in very very limited uh, uh, constrained environments where you just give a, a single image that is computer generated versus photos, and that can be already today be hard to uh, distinguish. So as soon as you animate the scene. I think there's lots of giveaways of what is the virtual scene um, because it's very hard to uh, uh, to present all the uh, the noise and uh, uh, surface detail and lighting uh, in the physical world. But uh, Dita has worked more uh, in rendering. Uh, I, I was just thinking that actually this is kind of the high road answer, and I have n nothing. You know, this is. Um, this is absolutely correct. Uh, there's also a low road answer just about the convergence of the technologies and uh, just facts. Microsoft HoloLens is now going OEM. Other vendors will build uh, HoloLens technology enabled devices. The first one is going to be a VR headset by Asus that is not intended for any form of mixed reality and they're just uh, using the superior inside out tracking uh, to deliver superior virtual reality gaming experiences at uh, apparently what is going to be a very competitive price. Um, and uh, th that just tells us that uh, we can, ex you know, if one of these things grows in the AR, VR, MR space, uh, it will help all the other uh, areas. And um, I'm, I'm really hoping that this will lead to positive unexpected effects uh, where suddenly you know things become super cheap and super available and uh, uh, th th and therefore they are uh, picked up by by a wide audience quickly and that would accelerate this convergence even though uh, you know the high road goal of is it really indistinguishable would would never be reached it wouldn't matter you just have more applications available Okay. Okay. Um, so, in the medium, short to medium term, my expectations are: I, I really would like to see a commercial, a commercially available solution uh, of light field displays. We have seen the demos uh, by Magic Leap by Avagant, uh, by uh, research prototypes, by NVIDIA, and now Microsoft. So we know this technology is coming, but we haven't seen a form factor yet that uh, would be commercially interesting or viable. So, uh, um, and that is why it's not out yet. Uh, there's problems with uh, the size of it. There's problems probably with the powering of it. Uh, and there may be... Um, uh, problems with the weight even of the headset, even if it's not uh, coupled with a, uh, um, uh, a belt-worn display or anything like that. So, but that product, I expect in the next two years, I think. Uh, and that will, will hopefully be a, uh, make a big like splash in terms of quality of a, a, a visual display. Um, a micro display, I mean, how small can you make it? So you heard our discussion on, uh, on uh, um, uh, contact lenses. Uh, Mark seems to be a little bit more optimistic than I am on that. I, I see uh, uh, pretty insurmountable problems to bring it down to that form factor. But making it even the size of uh, um, normal looking glasses is, I think, a challenge that uh, is not going to happen in these two years. So that's more a five year uh, kind of horizon uh, from my perspective. What needs to be done? We need optical engineers. 
that uh, really know their stuff and help bring, bring this along, and they need to have computer science experience too. It's something that doesn't exist really right now out of the universities. They're either uh, electronic engineers or they're computer scientists. We need these new hybrids, and it's beginning to happen. I mean, in all our labs, uh, we have students that are interested in different uh, directions and in different fields, and I think that that will actually contribute to the field quite a bit. Do you have a take on it, uh, Mark? Yes. I think there was a question, sorry, first uh, before you over there. Do you see a, a glass based or head mount display based uh, mobile phone coming in a few years? Yeah, I, I see a, a transition even before that. Um, uh, to me, it's very clear that uh, um, some big companies uh, uh, like. Uh, um, kind of idea of introducing these things in the market is, of course, via existing platforms. So if you think about Apple and all their support in voice uh, of augmented reality, and if you even look at the current iPhone, right, they introduced uh, um, like uh, a new camera with uh, two, sorry, a new phone with two cameras, ostensibly for a better continuous zoom. Well, two cameras can also be used for a lot of topics in the AR space. So it's very clear that uh, uh, with the next iPhone, we will see even more possibilities in terms of the sensors and the support of the phones. But they will sell the phones for the phone's sake, and now, I think, add on the AR experience as like uh, an additional um, like, uh, uh, functionality for people who are really aficionados or uh, early uh, um, entry uh, uh, people. And it's quite possible that, uh, that it will be coupled with a near eye display or with some kind of holder that actually puts the, the phone near to the head. I mean, these uh, uh, um, form factors exist for virtual reality already. There's no reason why they shouldn't be uh, possible for AR. But if you think about always on AR, you would really need a dedicated, well-engineered uh, uh, headset that is really small form factor. That is not going to happen anytime real soon, I think, as we said before. I could go, so. All right. All right, maybe one uh, last question well, here. Hanging on to the display question and, and your display section, um, what are your thoughts on the actual displays that we have available today, you know, OLED and limited factor, LCD, DLP, you see all different things, futuristic things like micro OLED. Just what, are, what are your thoughts on what's needed uh, for the industry in the specific? In terms of innovations there, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the developments over the last few years are actually very, very encouraging. We had seen before that, uh, let's say, uh, in the time period from 1994, five to 2008, very, very little innovation in the display market. And since then, uh, um, uh, we have seen uh, a lot of new things, uh, uh, obviously pushed by, by new densities uh, that are suddenly possible, and they are driven by, uh, um, by the personal computing market and the mobile devices. Um, I think that the novelties in this space, however, are not incremental. So they need dedicated new solutions. So, so that's a little bit of uh, a worry from uh, uh, your, your question seems to imply if we just incrementally improve what we have right now, we arrive at AR. I don't think that's true. We need so actually. I mean, do you need something like micro OLED? Do you need something like that? I, I almost mean, do, you, do you need to do a a paradigm shift, yeah. I think for, for light field displays, as you have seen with the technologies that we uh, talked about, we do need a different approach, right? And several different approaches have been introduced. The, the micro lenses, uh, um, the, uh, uh, the, the movable membrane, um, uh, the like, uh, uh, fiber optic uh, um, like, uh, projection display that actually paints onto your retina. These are all new uh, developments. Right. See so, uh, so yeah, I think we, we need that for the absolute breakthrough in display technology. Do light field displays need, because it's uh, multiple, uh, capturing light from multiple 
focus or whatever it is. Uh, so do you need a capture side as well? Like oh, yeah. Well, if, if, you want to, if you want to replay, a light field display is simply a display that will show a different image uh, for every vantage point. Within, it can be computer within, generated. Within some, um, some offset. So that would be the equivalent of an autostereoscopic display, if you're familiar with the big screens that have uh, a number of views shown simultaneously. Uh, lenticular and, displays, yeah, lent yeah, all lenticular displays, and they uh, so they can not only do you not need such a careful uh, head to display calibration, but also uh, you can uh, render depths of field effects and various focal cues uh, correctly because of this uh, large amount of information that comes out of the display, but. Uh, um, the content doesn't necessarily have to be a captured light field. I mean, you can go out and buy a Lytro camera and uh, t t photographically uh, acquire a light field, but uh, for augmented reality, it would primarily be synthetic content that is superimposed on top of a see-through version of, of the light field. Which means that you have to have a lot of processing yeah. power. Because yeah, yeah. Uh, for, for light field displays, but, they need to be powered by... But, but, but I was going to say, this is, this is another, uh, I think, very important point. As we are in the age of software-defined everything, that's what I like to say. There's software-defined radio. You put a wire into your uh, uh, AD uh, uh, interface, and suddenly you have a programmable radio. You... Uh, you can put it as, uh, I don't know, software-defined storage. You can rewrite the file system dynamically by emulating it. Yeah? Um, and uh, we, we are also probably looking into software-defined displays. Light field display, in my opinion, would be one instance of that, or holographic displays, where you, you use relatively simple components, even though they may not be in the marketplace yet, but they are much simpler than they used to be, and uh, you use a, a heavy computation to, to make them do what you want. Uh, and this heavy computation may not immediately go to, to mobile devices, but computation is something that we can optimize very well because we can uh, do that independently of any physical process. So you can even design uh, ASICs that, uh, that will do the computation just in the way you need them. This is actually the easy part in some sense. And, uh, uh, and, and I would call this a paradigm shift, that you're moving function away from dedicated hardware to, to software, and uh, you reach uh, performance levels that couldn't be reached before. I think that the dual camera on the iPhone that, that Tobias mentioned would be another example. That's computational photography, right? You, rather than physically moving a lens system, you are computing the equivalent uh, from, uh, from two fixed lens systems, which are much cheaper. and uh, Putting two uh, two CMOS sensors into the into the iPhone is uh, basically no cost factor anymore. Uh, so if we can think of of uh, developments in in these terms of shifting um, capabilities to software, then suddenly we can get these breakthroughs. I think this is a very important aspect also in the display space. Sure. Oh, definitely easier, yeah. And then, but as you, as you have uh, mentioned, the, uh, in, op in optical point of view, expressing the depth, depth in, a, in a more natural way is it more difficult and it also requires computation power. So I think, in my opinion, it will take some more time to, to realize that kind of display to, to the market. They're already on the market, right? So uh, the HoloLens has a waveguide display. Uh, Meta 2 has a reflection-based dis display. But, but still not, it's not perfect. 
Exactly, yeah. Uh, so the computer, computer requires some period of time to, to be developed, and then it should be more compact, and it should be should have. Yeah. So, so, so I, I mean, this is this is very subjective, and you, there can be multiple valid opinions. But I think uh, the HoloLens has a narrow field of view. If they wanted to make a wider field of view, it would be much bulkier. Uh, the meta is bulky <laughs> right now. Um, I think that just proves the point. Um, so the existing conventional optical designs, and I'm not an optical designer, uh, but these existing designs uh, seem to have a difficulty with reaching an acceptable ergonomic solution yeah, in total. And, and I think this is why we need the new optics designs. No, so that's a more a reflection-based display. Um, so it has a wider field of view. Uh, uh, it's... Um, the other question is, uh, is it worth it, right? So it is more difficult. Uh, it is more difficult to do uh, 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 light field displays. Uh, so what are the benefits? The benefits are you are solving uh, the accommodation version's mismatch. Um, so how much is that worth? Uh, right now, we don't have longitudinal studies of uh, use of current uh, displays, so we don't know how much of a um, uh, headache people get from uh, uh, having been introduced to, uh, to this artificial mismatch. Uh, we know that some people complained about like uh, movies in theaters that they watch with uh, uh, 3D polarized glasses uh, and they have that effect there but we, we don't know a lot about the long-term effects. So I think uh, it depends on that as well. I mean if people are fine uh, like uh, living with uh, this mismatch then you are right. Then it's the easier solution. And if you optimize that and put a lot of effort into that, you can get a uh, better product more quickly. But if you want to get something that is really similar to how we see the physical world, you probably want to go light uh, fields. And that's a bigger investment uh, in the long term. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I hope you got something out of uh, the course thank and you. enjoy. Enjoy your two days uh, or next days at AWE. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.